Hi, my name's Rich McNutt. I'm the author of the book Hunter's Choices. And what we're going to talk about here is sub-zero hunting and sub-zero camping. Personally, I started guiding in the Rocky Mountains back in the early 80s, and I'd take campers up into the mountains to do some camping. The coldest night I've spent on the ground on a hunt was 32 below zero. And like I said, my name is Mick Nutt, so I was born a nut. The rest of you people, you're going to have to work at it. But the coldest hunt I was on was about 30 degrees on a bow hunt. It was 30 degrees below zero with a 15 mile an hour wind, so we have to figure in wind chill. So an actual temperature is probably around 50 below zero. There's a lot of tricks you can do with clothing and with different types of gear and diet, and that's what we're going to talk about this series. If you booked your hunt a year in advance, weather is unpredictable. You, the weather guessers have a t hard time telling us what the weather's going to be a week from now, say a year from now. So a lot of times if you can't hunt in this sub-zero weather temperatures, you'll end up canceling a hunt which could cost you several grand. So what we'll cover here in these next couple clips is how to dress, your diet, and how to take care of yourself in this kind of temperatures. This clip we want to mention hypothermia. Hypothermia is nature's killing tool. What would happen is if you were crossing a stream and got wet or even if you're wearing waders in the stream and you got sweaty in them waders and then the temperature drops because you'll have a 40 to 50 degree temperature drop in the mountains. When that temperature drops, the moisture you have in your legs or in your clothing will cause you to suffer from hypothermia. With hypothermia, if your body temperature drops 10 degrees, you can, your mind no longer functions. You wouldn't even be able to recognize your car. You wouldn't be able to recognize your children because of the effects of hypothermia. If your body temperature gets below 80 degrees, your, your brain functions do not work anymore, and you cannot think clearly where you'll actually get lost five feet from your car because your system is being shut down, and you can't recognize your car as being your place of safety. Even experienced guides have trouble with hypothermia. In one hunt, we had a guide that came into camp. He left his horses on the other side of the ridge, so he had to walk down the mountain on the other side. He brought a hunter into camp, dropped him off, and he went to go get his horses. Well, the walk down the mountain and up the other side, he got extremely sweaty, and he was just wearing blue jeans like I am today because it was nice and warm out. When he got to his horses, the temperature dropped down to 20 degrees, and he had to ride, the horse trail had to ride six miles around the mountain to get back to camp. By the time he got to, back to camp, his jeans were froze to his legs. He couldn't get off the horse. I had the fireman carry him off the horse into the tent where we could thaw him out so he could recover. So what we're going to cover in the next couple of clips is how to be prepared for these type of situations so you're not caught out in a brush and suffering and you can make it back in, in a safe manner. The rifle hunter's number one excuse for missing game is, my scope was off. Telescopic sights, scopes, consistently become knocked out of alignment. Vibration, saddle scabbards, bumps, and falls all affect your scope's ability to remain sighted in. Generally, you get what you pay for, and a lack of scope durability in the field will cost you. How do you tell if your rifle scope or sights have been knocked out of alignment without shooting? A bore sighting tool will give you the confidence you need in the field to know your weapon is still sighted in. I recommend hunters take a shot every few days to verify sight alignment, rather than waiting to verify by missing a trophy animal. The best time of day to verify sights is generally midday, and I try to be in someone else's hunting area rather than my own. Some guides say that a shot in the mountains scares off the big game. They haven't spent much time in the mountains then. Every weekend, hundreds of people come to the mountains for target practice. The animals are accustomed to hearing shooting all year round. Many sportsmen use the woods for shooting practice. For safety reasons, check your backdrop. 
a steep hill or dirt bank works best. If using scattered trees, always take a walk behind your target, even on your own private land. A shooting accident involving your neighbor's pet or young children is difficult to live with. On one backpack archery hunt with an ex-army ranger friend in central Colorado, we encountered a commercial poaching camp. All the trucks and equipment were covered in camouflage netting and were guarded by three Doberman pinchers. I was almost all the way through their camp before the Dobermans started barking. One of the outlaws from the camper came out and forced the dogs to be quiet. My friend spotted several hunters in full camouflage, hunting with high-powered rifles. We were dressed in full camouflage and face paint, as usual, and the outlaw didn't let on that he had spotted me. Fearing for our lives, if we had been spotted, we walked all night to get back to our truck. After daybreak, within the last mile to our truck, my friend spotted two guys on a rock pile in front of us, aiming a rifle our way. We were in a long, open meadow, and I couldn't see anybody, so I doubted what he saw. My doubt lasted until the anthill, 15 yards to our left, blew up, and then, as we heard the report from a rifle. Fearful of the poachers, we were already jumpy. Two hours before daylight, we had been circled by a huge pack of wolves. As we stood back to back, with our sidearms ready, we realized we didn't have enough bullets between us to defend ourselves. It was so foggy and dark, we could barely make out the shape of the wolves as they crashed brush within ten yards of us. About the time we were going to fire a warning shot, one of the wolves moved. We had nearly had a heart attack over a flock of black Angus cows. By morning, we were at our wit's end. We had walked all night in the rainy fog to escape the poachers and their Dobermans. We had used up all our food and water for breakfast the day before, and now we were getting shot at. There was nowhere to run, and the rifleman on the rock had a clear shot at the parking lot with our truck in it. Our next meal... In this next clip, we're going to talk about wind chill and wind chill factors. This is a critical consideration when you're dealing with the outdoors. The wind chill and your dress, you dress for wind chill, not for the temperature that you have outside. For instance, right here, since we've been filming here for this clip, the cloud came over and the temperature dropped 10 degrees just in the last two minutes. And the wind chill actually adds, adds extra to that temperature drop. So a wind chill... We'll, we'll take a look at this wind chill chart, and it'll show you what kind of temperature drops you have, even for a minor change in the wind. On this wind chill chart, you have the temperature across the top, and then you have the wind speed along the sides. And then you just cross-reference your data, and you'll come up with the actual real temperature, real-life temperature that you have to dress for. A 5-degree shift in the wind will drop the actual real-life temperature 10 to 15 degrees. This wind chill chart is available from the NOAA weather, or, and a National Weather Service as a free download from their website. Frostbite and freezer burn are essentially the same thing. Frostbite occurs when the outer layer of your skin actually freezes. I happen to be guiding at 10 below temperatures and I didn't switch my gloves off at noon like I normally do. But I can't, with the horse, I used to stick my fingers underneath the saddle blanket of the horse to warm them up. But my gloves picked up the moisture that the animal was perspiring from under the saddle. So what happened was I, froze, I actually frostbit the outer layer of my fingers and I lost two or three layers of skin. And this is ten years later, I still cannot pick up finger food like french fries 
I've lost that layer of skin, so those french fries are too hot for me to pick up. Frostbite is a real subtle feeling. It isn't like getting hit with a hammer. What happens with frostbite is you start feeling warm. My fingers are really cold. It was 10 below out. I was doing everything. We was on stand for about two hours. I didn't have all this extra gear because I was packing in with horses and we were planning on leaving a little bit early. But frostbite is a slow penetrating of cold and then all of a sudden your hands will feel warm and that's your danger signal. Because what happened is it actually burns the ends of your nerve endings off. It freezes the ends of your nerves so you no longer feel the cold. To counteract the effects of frostbite once you feel your hands get warm, I knew I was in trouble so I went and exchanged to a new pair of gloves, ones that were dry, and then I warmed up my hands and my armpits so I wouldn't have any more frostbite damage. In this clip we're going to talk a little bit about clothing design. The design of your clothing itself will actually help you get down to that 30 to 40 to minus below temperatures and still be comfortable. But the clothing design will also help you be comfortable when it's plus 30 or plus 40 degrees. This, this jacket here happens to be a button jacket, so with the buttons this will be more comfortable in the plus or, te plus or range temperatures because you can open up a button to help vent off some of the heat from your exercise when you're walking around. This next jacket has a zipper on the front of it. Now the zipper will hold in more heat than the buttons will. But also this is a plastic zipper, not a metal zipper. The metal zipper will actually steal heat from you, where the plastic zipper will actually help hold in more heat for you. Okay, this next garment is a pullover outer garment. The pullover garment with no no place for the air to escape it will add another 5 to 10 degrees to your comfort level. This next garment is a pair of bib overalls. The bib overalls will hold in a tremendous amount of heat compared to wearing a belt. Usually that gap will go through all your garment levels, so having that gap at your belt line causes a lot of problems for heat retention. In this clip, we're going to talk about the first layer of clothing for sub-zero hunting. The first layer of clothing should be ladies' pantyhose. Ladies' hosiery will actually take the body heat from your groin and transfer it right straight to your toes. A lot of guys have a little problem with this, but if the professional football players can wear hosiery while they're playing games in cold weather, the hunters can do it too. The most common mistake that people make in the field when we're talking temperatures below zero, is wearing cotton underwear. Cotton underwear absorbs moisture, and moisture is a killer, and the moisture is what's going to keep you cold in the field. If you're hunting in 30 below weather, get rid of the cotton. You have no cotton in your garments whatsoever until you get to your outer coats. And when you're walking around in the field, even if it's 30 below out, your armpits and your groin area 
is going to produce moisture because that's where the most of your heat is generated in your body. By using pantyhose in that area or, or hosiery, that hosiery will actually take that heat and pipeline it right down your legs, down your toes. In this clip we're going to talk about your second layer of clothing. Your second layer of clothing should be silk. Silk has a lot of other benefits to it than just heat transfer, which it aids in the heat transfer from the nylon of the, of the lingerie. It also increases the body temperature. It works as a scent block in some cases, but it also, insects don't like it. If you're in an area that's heavy in ticks, you can wear silk under your clothing and it, the ticks will avoid you. When we're talking about layering, putting on layering clothes, we're not talking about just piling on more clothes. Most of the people I take out into the brush in, the, in heavy winter conditions, they think piling on clothing is, is layering. Layering is also having the right clothing in the right order. And if you do it in this order that I describe, you will be comfortable in 30 below temperatures versus freezing in 30 below temperatures and not being able to hunt or not be able to participate in your outdoor activities that you're planning on and in a lot of cases you paid for in advance. Hi, welcome to the www.hunterschoices.com website. I am Richard McNutt, the author of Hunter's Choices, choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. The Hunter's Choices book series is not about the newest space age equipment or the next greatest gadget built since the invention of sliced bread. It is a training series on field proven techniques and tips on when and how to use the space age equipment and when and how to use those fantastic gadgets. You can have the best camouflage created by modern man, but if you are in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, at the wrong time, you will not even see a big game animal much less get a shot opportunity. You can hunt by luck or you can hunt by skill. The Hunter's Choices series is designed to help those who choose to hunt by developing their skills. The book series is based upon experiences while hunting public lands, not private land or ranch hunting. The series also describes various types of camping styles. So you shall find the technical and species information I share in Hunter's Choices will be valid whether you deer hunt from a lodge in Canada to Texas, hog hunt from a camper in Alabama to California, elk hunt from a tent in Montana to Mexico, or hunt any other big game species in between. Understanding the life cycles of the big game animal and how those cycles relate to your hunting season and camping methods is a major factor in determining your hunting success. I love to hunt with educated hunters. So Hunter's Choices patrons are welcome to come along and camp with us. The hunting philosophy I endorse throughout this book series is to learn how to control the controllable factors of your hunt. Learning which factors of your hunt that are controllable depending upon the game you are pursuing, your camping style, your choice of equipment, and hunting situations is the real secret to your hunting success. For 10 years I managed the largest bow hunting club in Denver, Colorado. As the club president, I spoke at many seminars and shows and coordinated and hosted several big game hunts per year. One of the reasons this site exists is from the encouragement of hunting club members and seminar participants to write down all the humorous and educational situations I have been in as a hunter and as a guide. As a guide, I worked for a premier backcountry outfitter with wilderness hunting camps. I personally bought several public land Pope and Young listings and have guided for many more. As the reader comments page confirms, if you wish for a fulfilling hunting or wilderness experience, whether you are a beginning hunter, a non-hunter, or an experienced trophy hunter, the philosophies I share in the Hunter's Choices series will increase your wilderness camping and big game hunting enjoyment and success. Change a good hunt into a great hunt with Hunter's Choices, choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. Have a great hunt.
In this clip, we're going to be talking about your third layer of undergarments. In this layer, we're using long johns, polypropylene long johns, and they come in four different grades of thicknesses. So if it's not 30 below zero, you don't need the heavy grade five. You can use the lighter grades depending on the temperature and depending on the wind chill. What I strongly suggest is, is that you get the separate grades. Don't get two or three small grades and try and and bulk up and wear three layers of polypropylene because it makes you uncontrollable in the woods. You won't be able to maneuver very well. You'll get hung up on brush. You'll get fall down on logs because you're bound up by having too much clothing on. So this is polypropylene and I prefer a union suit over the partition long johns. By having this joint here all the way through your clothing, by having this waistband, this is where your material is compressed from the waistband, and this is also where most of your heat will escape because of the waistband. So just by switching to a union suit, you'll end up gaining an extra 10 to 15 degrees body temperature where you can survive in that much colder weather. Okay, in this clip we're going to talk about your outer garment layer. And your, your outer garment should be a wool coat, a wool of some sort. And there's a variety of different grades of wool. Whether you went polar fleece, machined wool, you get wool with the lining. This happens to be a knitted wool. The knitted wool actually gives you a little more lift and it has more durability. If you get a wool with lining, it has a little more compression to it so it's not quite as good comfort wise but the lining also helps with the wind. The next item to consider is an overcoat, an over foul weather gear to, to wear over the top of your wool. By adding this shell it increases your comfort range another 10 to 15 degrees. It, it adds for water repellent, it repels the snow and it works as a wind block. So when those three conditions force you to dress warmer you can add the shell. This shell here also has a down liner. I could put add a down liner to it so it also increases my comfort rating. When I put all this together, everything that we've talked about, I could be comfortable in 32 below weather for up to four or five hours. I can sit on stand and sit motionless for two hours in 30 below weather. In this clip we want to talk a little bit about your gloves and your hats. These little things will make a very big difference and a very critical difference staying comfortable in sub-zero weathers. Just like with the silk clothing, you start with, start with a silk liner and work your way up. And You do this both with your head covering and on your gloves. You start with a silk liner and then go with a polypropylene liner and then on top of the propylene liner, I prefer to wear a glomit, which is a glove mitten combination. This is a wool glomit. And by working it this way, I now have my fingers free to adjust things, to, to pull the trigger, to shoot to get things out of my gear without having to take my gloves off and get my whole hand chilled in that manner. And then also for fall weather purposes you can get a leather shell to put over the top of the mitten that will also still have a little crease in it where you can get your finger out to work the trigger. Okay, the other consideration, and this is where most of your heat loss will come from, is around your neck and from your head. So your head covering and around your neck become very very critical to maintain your body heat in sub-zero temperatures. A nice silk scarf wrapped around your neck will increase your body temperature while you're on stand by a good 15 to 20 degrees. This keeps the heat from too much heat from escaping around your neck in your open collar area and it also works as, as a regulator so you can regulate your body temperature. When you start getting too warm you can open the scarf or take it off and then put the scarf back on. Okay, the same thing with using the silk face mask first and then followed by wool 
And then you, on top of the wool you can put a, put a weather cover. This is where people that wear glasses really have a problem because now all my moisture, all that's coming evaporating out of my body, escapes around my glasses. So keeping glasses thawed out in, in these temperatures is hard to do. So try to wear plastic lenses or go to two pair of glasses and you take one pair off, you stick them in your pocket so they warm up and then you're constantly switching glasses. So if you're handicapped like I am where you have to wear glasses all the time, this becomes a little bit of a hassle. Hello, this is Richard McNutt, the author of Hunter's Choices, choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. And this is audiobook volume one of a five part series. On the back cover I mentioned my hunting philosophy of controlling the controllable factors of your hunt. You can hunt by luck, or you can hunt by refining your hunting skills and learn more and more. Inside the case, you get two CDs covering 168 minutes of hunting options that directly affect your hunting success. The most common is that of the fantasy camouflage worn by most hunters today while in pursuit of big game. Inside on the back cover is a bio of my background and that of Steve Cook, the talented narrator of the CD. Inside the front label, you get a listing of the subject tracks covered by each CD. Refer to www.hunterschoices.com website for close-up details on the tracks and to view the pictures mentioned inside the audiobook and to purchase your copy of Hunter's Choices, choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. In this clip we want to talk a little bit about some items to avoid in your pockets. I had one hunter carrying a pocket knife in his pocket and he actually got freezer burn on his leg from the heat transfer, or let's put it this way, from the cold transferring through the metal into his leg. So things like pocket knives, keys, change, don't carry these in the field with you in sub-zero weathers because all these things are going to cause, will, will make you cold. The other thing that you have to worry about is your ammunition. Many people have, like in this jacket here, I've got a pouch to hold my ammunition, but I noticed that this part of my chest was freezing cold because of the bullets on this side of the, of the coat. A lot of people carry bullets in their pockets. Don't do that unless you can wrap them up. One of the tricks that we found that we could use, we take our same bandana, wrap the bullets up in the bandana and that gives extra insulation to keep the steel from actually frostbiting your skin through your clothing. In this clip I want to talk a little bit about things not to bring to the mountains. If you're in real cold weather, one of the real common articles is down but you don't want to get wet in down. Down actually loses 70% of its heat retention once it's wet. And you can't control the weather, so getting wet if you're wearing down garments or even sleeping gear, if your sleeping gear gets wet, it's a life-threatening situation. When you're working with wool, a wool garment will still maintain 90% of its heat retention even if it's soaked in the river. You can fall in the river and still maintain 90% of its heat retention. So it, falling in the river on a day like today, 40 degrees out, would be a life-threatening situation if you were wearing down. Another common mistake that a lot of people make is they bring rain gear up in the mountains for survival gear. What rain gear does is it traps the moisture within your clothing up against your body. What by not allowing the moisture to evaporate, this actually makes you colder than it would have been if you kept the rain gear off. If you're actually raining out, put the rain gear on. When it stops raining and you can dry off a little bit, take the rain gear off. I don't recommend hunting with rain gear on because of the noise that the clothing makes. But keeping yourself dry and keeping water out of your clothing and moisture out of your clothing in sub-zero temperatures it becomes a real critical issue. If it's 30 or 40 degrees out and you're a little bit damp, it doesn't really matter. If it's 10 degrees below zero or 20 degrees below zero, 
and you put this rain gear on, the moisture that you trap in your clothing will actually freeze in your outer layers of clothing and you'll lose your insulation effect that you get from the clothing and from the layering that we've done earlier. In this clip I'd like to mention some things about diet. When you're talking about surviving weathers, temperatures in a minus 30 degree range, your diet becomes a, a critical choice. Things to avoid in your diet is going to be caffeine. A lot of people think a hot cup of coffee is going to warm them up, but you get your temporary warm up from the hot liquid, but then your body loses temperature, you lose body heat as your body processes the caffeine. So things like chocolate, soda, those things you want to avoid in sub-zero temperatures. Another reason you want to avoid caffeine is because of the amount of water your body burns to digest the caffeine. In winter climates when it's really cold out, you'll be very surprised at how much water your body actually burns to maintain body temperature. You'll end up drinking more water when it's below zero than you will doing the same activities when it's 70, 60 or 70 degrees outside. So water consumption becomes critical in, in these extra cold temperatures. So if you drink a, a medium sized soda, you have to drink three times that water to burn that caffeine out of your system. So in, in sub-zero temperatures, you will want to stay to purified water if you can and avoid the chlorinated water or water with additives to it. Your purified water will actually go through your system and help your system generate body heat in a much efficient manner. And all these little tricks really add up when it's 35 below zero. When it's only zero out, you can fudge on a lot of these things. But when it gets really cold out and you're out in it, all this stuff adds up and it will make you a real comfortable hunter. In this clip I want to mention some of the good foods that you can eat that will actually help generate body heat. And again this will be the high carb stuff, whether it's pasta, potatoes, or oatmeal. Those kind of foods actually give you a, generate more body heat. Most of your heat is generated in your body by digestion. So before you go out in this cold weather, always eat. Don't even if you're on a diet, forget your diet if it's 30 below zero. Eat a good meal before you go out, and the process of digesting your food will actually increase your body heat. One of the good drinks to take out in the field would be tomato soup or hot tomato juice. This way you can avoid the caffeine from the coffee and still have a nice warm drink in the thermos while you're in the field. A good snack in the field instead of candy bars would be oatmeal cookies because oatmeal generates a lot of body heat. I'm sure, I'm sure that when you've had oatmeal in the mornings, you've noticed that your body is much warmer and you sweat easier than on mornings that you have a breakfast with an egg or something like that. Hello, this is Richard McNutt, the author of Hunter's Choices, choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. And this is audiobook volume two of the five-part series. The front cover of volume two boasts a mule deer. On the back cover, I mention my hunting philosophy of controlling the controllable factors of your hunt. Inside the case, you get two CDs covering 164 minutes of hunting options that directly affect your hunting success. Volume 2 covers different hunting strategies with more on fantasy camouflage and personally smelling the salt close encounters with bears, wolves, and more. Inside on the back cover is a bio of my background and that of Steve Cook, the talented narrator of the CD. Inside the front label, you get a listing of the subject tracks covered for each CD. Refer to www.hunterschoices.com website for close-up details of the tracks, a sample audio track, and you can follow the album links to view the pictures mentioned inside the audiobook and purchase your copy of Hunter's Choices 
choices you can make to improve your big game hunting success. In this clip we're going to talk about features to look for when you're sleeping on the ground in sub-zero temperatures and some things to avoid when you're sleeping on the ground in sub-zero temperatures. This is what I kind of look for is I look for a pine tree that gives me a lot of overhead shelter from the wind, from the rain, from the snow and this also will give you a, a nice bedding to put your sleeping gear on because you'll have three, six or even eight inches of pine needles down there you scrape the snow off, get down to the fresh needles, and you'll stay much warmer than you will in any other conditions sleeping outside. Okay, in this particular location, because of these rocks here, this happens to be a very poor place to try and spend the night in sub-zero temperatures. These rocks, just like picking a spot to set up your stand, these rocks will absorb the heat out of your body, and you'll, there'll be no way that you can stay warm with this type of rock formation this close to your sleeping area. If you can't find a pine tree with a bed of needles to set your sleeping gear on, your next best choice is a sandy gravel area that doesn't hold moisture. By using sand and gravel, the water's not held there to freeze like it would be if it was a grassy spot. With grass, it would be like sleeping on an ice cube, and that ice melts while you're in the bed, and then it soaks into your sleeping gear. So that's why you always try and look for a nice sandy spot to set your gear up. Your second choice is have a canvas layer on the outside of your bag first instead of plastic. Avoid the plastic underneath because the heat transfer is kind of like the rock. It just, it just absorbs the heat right out of your gear. Your first layer on the ground should be canvas. The canvas helps insulate between that frost layer and yourself. One of the greatest problems I have with hunters is they come to camp with a sleeping bag that doesn't have a rating to it. Check your rating on your sleeping gear. Each sleeping bag has a rating. If it's not rated, it's not meant to be used outside of the house. Most of your sleeping bags on the market are actually sleepover bags for your kids to use and not to be used in the wilderness. This bag here has a commercial rating on it of 10 degrees. And just like we did with layering our clothes, you layer your sleeping bags. This bag is a Qualifil 4, which is also rated for a zero degree bag. So I can take the two bags and put them together. And this, and this sleeping arrangement would be effective for about 10 below zero. Just like, in this, just like with our hunting clothes, we put a shell on this sleeping gear or another canvas tarp and I could, you could survive comfortable at 30 below temperature sleeping outside. A wool blanket to use like we use on the scarf, use a wool blanket for sleeping gear. The very dangerous thing to do is to breathe inside your sleeping gear. A lot of people will close up the bag around their head and they'll breathe inside the sleeping gear and what you're doing is you're exhausting a lot of moisture into your sleeping bag and you'll never recover from that. You will actually freeze to death by breathing into your sleeping bag. Infrared light. A few wars ago, the U.S. Air Force discovered that when the Army fed their ground troops beef, the troops would show up on the infrared night bombing scopes from their aircraft. It became a practice to feed beef to the Allied troops the days of nighttime bombing raids. If the infrared scope on the aircraft could see a trooper that ate beef, could the infrared light-seeing animals see hunters after we ate beef? Among the club members, we were able to observe this in real field situations. Some hunters removed red meat from their diet during portions of the hunting season. The objective was to observe the big game animals' responses. Most hunters refused to participate, thinking this whole issue a ridiculous joke. About eight of us went overboard with the tests. 
Not only did we test the ultraviolet and infrared theories, we tested all the scents and calls you could imagine, along with different camouflage clothing, materials, colors, and patterns. I cannot say the tests were orchestrated from a plan, but from the personal preferences present in the wide variety of hunters we had in the club. We had some advantages over other hunting clubs. The greatest is that the club revolved around the workplace. So, at lunches and breaks, the members could get together to share adventures and findings. Off times, we hunting club members met at the same table for lunch. Most of the good news and all of the bad found a way to my ears as the residing club president. Because of the workplace situation, a tremendous amount of information was being passed around and shared among club members. I miss those long, drawn-out discussions. Well, arguments on minute details, like the advantages of using white face paint, or if skunk scent was better than fox urine as a cover-up scent. I would like to interject a comment here about a basic difference between hunting on public lands in Colorado versus the eastern states. The tree stand can seldom be used in western Colorado. The trees are much shorter and of softer wood. I have seen hunters in a tree stand 10 feet off the ground sway the tree 3 feet by shifting weight from one cheek to the other. Elk and mule deer are not as trail dedicated as white-tailed deer and tend to wander more. Most western hunting is done from ground blinds or still hunting. Therefore, camouflage and cover scents play a more significant role in your success rate in the western states. We had 80 to 120 members in the hunting club and we always kept a scorecard of the successful hunters. Over a 10-year time period the top 20 hunters of the club seldom changed. The odds of harvesting a deer with a bow in Colorado are less than 18%. Remember, in Colorado, you only get one tag for one season and you're done hunting. This means that the average bow hunter would harvest a deer every five to six years. More than 70% of the club fell into this achievement rate. How, then, do we explain a group of 8 to 10 hunters that scored animals each and every year? What did the consistently successful hunters do differently? What is it the average hunter is not willing to do? The odds of harvesting an elk with a bow in Colorado are less than 6%. Some individuals scored every year or two with a bow. What did these highly successful hunters do differently? From field observations, we are safely able to conclude that the non-red meat diet did affect how big game responded. In this clip, we're going to talk about body bags. Now, a body bag, from a hunter's point of view, it's not something you carry a body out in, but a body bag helps hold your heat in. And this item, as far as my hunting equipment goes, this is actually my pride and joy of all of all of my equipment. The body bag, even sitting outside, I can I can stand. It was last year I spent six hours. In 18 below weather, in this bag, with the garments on that, that we showed earlier, with those layers of garments. But what the body bag does is help protect you from the wind, and it also help when you close it up. This is a prototype that we're still working on, but they are, they are on the market already. I was looking for one where I could get my hands out to make the shot without actually getting out of the bag. And you can adjust your headgear accordingly to help maintain your body heat. This body bag will make a tremendous difference in how long you can withstand, stay on stand in sub-zero temperatures. A typical hunt in 30 below temperatures, you're on stand for about 30 minutes because of the clothing deficiencies that most hunters have. 
This bag will add hours to your ability to stay on stand. Whether you're hunting in, in northern Canada or Alaska, this type of equipment becomes very effective. I also like to use this equipment inside of a blind. It's just sitting on a regular chair where I'm at here, but, it, but it's real comfortable and you can stay here for hours without getting cramped up and having to move. Thanks for joining us here on this topic and I hope to see you on some future clips. This is Rich McNutt with Hunter's Choices.